Hey, happy Father's Day, dads. Today, and for you dads who are online today, welcome. Happy Father's Day to you as well. And dads, when you leave today, we're going to have, make sure you see there's, there's going to be donuts for dads. We've got some boards out. Those will be loaded up. So make sure you partake in that. And I know some of you dads online this morning are having breakfast in bed. Because I've talked to a couple of you, so maybe some of you share in the chat what you think about breakfast in bed right now with watching church. So, yeah, I'm blessed to, that there's many things that I'm thankful for about my father. And uh, one of which is, he's a good sounding board for decisions when I have them. And at this point in my life, usually those decisions are something sizable if I talk to him and need to bounce some things through his ears. And last fall I had one of those moments. I had a a morning where I was extremely frustrated um, and actually angry as well. I know frustration is just anger. I was angry because I, uh, I was looking at a broke car in my driveway. And you have to, you have to realize that the year before uh, I had called my dad and we, I ended up putting a rebuilt motor into the car. It was a pretty sizable investment. And anyways, I was now one month past warranty. Okay, so you know what's coming. And I did. I had a totally bad engine sitting in my driveway. Yeah, it's just like unbelievable. So I thought, you know, I just, I couldn't even think straight. And I say, I just, I'll give Dad a call. I say, Dad, you know, here's what's up. And uh, I just need you to listen. I want your advice, but I just need you to listen. And we talked through it. And, you know, after a long conversation and just talking about life and what he had been through in life and stuff too and came back around and he just really came to the the conclusion that you know here's probably your best option talk about it with Stace and see what you guys think well long story short is we ended up putting a brand new engine in the car this time and uh that still stings Uh, we have paid double in engines what we paid for the car, but the car's got enough life in it. Yeah, anyways, that's life. Holy smokes. Uh, but another piece of advice my dad has always given me growing up, and I, I, I've heard him say this within the last two months, and I, I grew up hearing this all the time, where he'd say, Chad, life is not made up of the dreams that you dream, but the choices that you make. Hey, isn't that true? No, those aren't his words. He grabbed them from somewhere. Some of you probably have heard that. It's, that's a common phrase. And choices are something that we do every day. And the choices that we're making today, many of them affect our today and our tomorrow leading into them. And so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at a dad whose choices, the choices he made forever impacted his family's life and his life. Because this dad realized that life comes from walking with God. If you're able, would you please stand with me as we read the opening part of our text this morning. And the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination and the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. You can be seated. Please join me as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer and You know, Lord, it's so easy to plow through Scripture that is so familiar sometimes and not even hear what we need to hear. 
And I know for me that can be the case, especially in Noah. It's, it's a story for a lot of us that's so familiar. But Lord, I want to invite your Holy Spirit this morning to speak to us from your words today. Grab our hearts, our attention. Use it to change us. And it's easy for me, Lord, to even view a man like Noah where I just think, man, he, he had to be superhuman or blessed with some spiritual ability to live the way he did. And, but in reality, as we see, he was just a man and a person just like us. He was flawed and he was in need of your grace in his life. And Noah found grace in your eyes, Lord, and you used him to do something amazing in his life. And so, Lord, that gives me hope when I see that because I realize that when I and we find your grace in our life, you can use it to do amazing things. And Lord, lastly, I just uh, want to pray for Pastor Jeff this morning. I know he's watching right now. Jeff, we love you. Lord, I pray for healing on his eye from the surgery he just recently had. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage Jeff today. Lord, that he would sense our love for him, and most of all, that he'd sense your love for him. And Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I debated with this text of starting off in such a dark place. You know, it's like, poof. Happy Father's Day, the world's about to be destroyed, guys, because of the sin of mankind. But I thought, no, it's, it's good. It's, it's the starting point. We're not going to end there. It gets going to get better. But I think it's important for us to remember where Noah was at and what he had to face and deal with. And in verse 5, you know, it says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. All of humanity, all of men, all the women had slumped into the depths of sin. You know, our natural default, our basic wiring that we're born with is as 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, that they will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And we naturally will turn our backs on God and it will lead us to our own destruction if we don't seek to walk with Him and to seek His face. In verse 6 and 7 it continues that the Lord is grieved and He's deeply saddened by what He sees. And being that sin has a cost to it, it has a heavy price to it. At this moment in history, God declares judgment on the sin of humanity and death is going to be the result and the payment for the sin. And it's truly a dark place. A dark place that Noah is living in. And you wonder, is there any hope when you read a passage like that going, is there a spark of hope? Is there a chance at redemption? And verse 8 starts with, but Noah... What a great place for a but, right? But Noah, ah, there's a spark of hope. There's something that may bring light and bring hope to humanity. God is looking and searching over all humanity, wondering, is there anyone? Is there anyone left who remembers me? Is there anyone left who worships me? who honors me, and he sees Noah. A man who is surrounded by all the sin, all the corruption, and God sees his heart and what's in it. And Noah finds favor in God's eyes. Noah finds grace in God's eyes. Noah finds life. Because life comes through walking with God. So what did Noah do to find such favor with God? Well, we're going to take a look at that and just break that down this morning. Verse 9 in the text reads this account of Noah. That Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Well, the first thing about Noah worth noting is that Noah was a man of faith. 
You know, this is the starting place of all relationships with God. Hebrews 11.6 says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So in order for Noah to receive God's favor and His grace, he first had to respond in faith towards God. See, Noah understood that God desired to have a relationship with him. Noah also understood that his sin had fractured that relationship. And that in order to be restored with God, he needed to approach God and worship God through the sacrifices that God had laid out. And he did. He responded that to that in God responded to Noah with grace and with favor. And the same is true for us today. No matter where you're at in your, your walk, your walk has to start with that initial faith in God. And the, the story's still the same. The platform's still the same. The one thing that has brought clarity and is now the plan of God is the sacrifice and the plan God had is what was done on that cross right there. And that responding to what Jesus Christ, God's Son, did for us to restore our relationship to Him is to accept that in faith, Jesus' death and burial and resurrection as the sacrifice that paid for my sin, that paid for your sin. And when we respond to that, we find favor in God's eyes. We find grace there in God's eyes. Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You know, faith takes courage to live out. Noah is surrounded by a culture and a society that has lost their way completely in faith in God. It has some familiar rings to us even this day as we see some of the things that go on in our culture and the world in a post-Christian culture that doesn't want to acknowledge the existence of God anymore. But Noah chose to stand in faith. And in doing so, he stepped onto an island of isolation in his life. You think about life for Noah. He stood alone leading his family in faith. He had nobody to sound off of. Nobody to meet with to talk about the things of God and what God was doing in his life, what God was doing in their life. He had no encouragement outside of his own family to do that. No friends to share that shared a common faith with him. He was alone and willingly chose to stand there. Let that sink in for a moment. The silence of loneliness that he must have felt. And some of you are alone today. You're you're alone at your workplace. Some of you are alone in your family, in your faith. And Noah chose to stand alone and you're doing the same. And my encouragement is for you today is to remember that no matter where you're at, That God sees you. God saw Noah. And God sees you even when you're standing alone in those moments in your walk. And God recognizes your faithfulness. And the Lord will reward your faithfulness to Him. You know, we have a blessing that Noah didn't. Okay, just look around the room for a minute. Just humor me. Look around the room quick. You're looking at back of heads because everybody's looking around doing the same thing you're doing. All right? You're not alone this morning. Those of you watching online, whether you're watching alone right now, you're not alone. In fact, share that in the chat. I'm not alone today. And I don't know where you're at in your faith journey, whether you're new to the Christian faith in your faith with Jesus, whether you're wounded in your faith. You may be doubting in your faith today. You may be soaring in your faith 
today. But in a room this size, you are not alone. There is someone just like you walking a similar path that you are in their faith journey right now. But Noah had nobody. Dads, you're not alone. You have other dads this morning here who are in the same place you are in your faith walk. Some dads are trying to figure out what this Jesus thing is all about. Some of you have been walking passionately with him for years. There's more than one of each of you in this room this morning right now. You're not alone. Noah had nobody. He had crickets. And crickets tend to get quiet when you show up to see them. Uh, but God saw Noah and God sees you. Don't give up. You know, life starts with walking in faith with God. Because life comes through walking in faith with God. And the second thing Noah had, he had a relationship with God. His faith led him to a relationship with God. Genesis 5.23, we back up in the text, coming into the life of the Noah, reads this, Altogether Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Noah had a godly heritage. Enoch was one of Noah's great, great, great grandfathers. So somewhere we know because of where Noah is right now, there was a spiritual thread of faith that was getting passed on through his families, generation after generation. And at some point in that, from what Noah had been told, Noah stepped out in faith and internalized what he heard and said, I believe that. I believe that to be true. And at that point, Noah just didn't have a religion. He had a relationship with a living God. It changed Noah. You know, when you have a relationship with someone, you care about what the other person cares about. Especially if you have a healthy relationship. That's the context of it, obviously. So when you enter into a relationship with Jesus, you should be caring deeply about the things that Jesus cares about. And it will change you. It will change your attitude. It will change your behavior. It will change the way you think. It should be changing the way you make decisions and choices. When you have a relationship with Jesus, you discover a new life. You realize that real life comes through walking with Jesus. And Noah discovered that life comes through walking with God. And the third thing we see in Noah, by just the titles and descriptions given to him, is that Noah took sin seriously in his life. 2 Peter 2.5 says this about Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah spent his life, much of it, telling those around him what God expected. And that they needed to get right with God. They needed to repent and turn away from their sins. And yet we see... In Scripture, that Noah himself, he was not a sinless man. It's easy to read a title like that and think, man, he had it perfect. He was a superhero. No. No, Noah was a sinful man. In fact, verse 8, when you look at that, it says, Noah, he found favor in God's eyes. Well, if he found it, that means he needed it. And he did receive it. And we're also reminded in... Genesis, near the, after the flood and they're getting off the ark, near the end of chapter 9, that one of Noah's not most proud moments, where he gets, uh, he gets drunk, has an embarrassing moment with his family. He wasn't a perfect man. And so when you see some of those, you think, well, why, why in verses 8 and 9 do you desc is he described as a righteous man, a blameless man among the people? A man who faithfully walked with God. That sounds perfect. 
Well, I think the answer is this, because God saw the desire in Noah's heart. You see, Noah had a desire similar to the desire of King David. And we know of some of King David's face plants through his life. But listen to what King David penned in Psalm 101, the first four verses. David says, I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Now we certainly know David was not a perfect man, and yet he penned that, and he was noted and titled with being a man after God's own heart. Noah had a desire to serve God. He had a desire to walk as pure as he could before God. He had a desire to keep short accounts of his faults with God. Can I ask you, is that what God sees in your heart this morning? I think it's one of the most sobering things to do is to look into the mirror of your soul before the Lord Does he see the same thing that he saw in King David that he saw in Noah? Or has grace maybe allowed complacency to be a place of comfort of your heart? We excuse the inexcusable. We accept the unacceptable. You know, complacency is one of the most dangerous places to our walk in faith. It stagnates our faith. It starves our relationships. It blinds us to sin. And sin is the biggest roadblock in your spiritual life and growth. Noah wasn't complacent. He wasn't satisfied with, ah, that's good enough. Where are you at today? When was the last time you honestly asked Jesus, Uh, Lord, where where do I need to work in my relationship with you? What is there something, what sin in my life have I found complacency with that should have no part? Now, I'll share with you how the Lord has worked on my heart over the last few months and now weeks. And uh, I had a time where I I asked that question specifically. You know, Lord, what's going on in my life that needs some work? And the answer that came back, I didn't fully expect. And uh, he said, Chad, you know what? You're letting anger creep into some of your relationships. And some of my response and pride was, well, you know, it's, it's not that bad. But you know what, Lord, I'll, I'll share that. I'll share that with a brother at church. I'll pray about that. I'll get control of that. And there's part of the problem is the owl. How many of you have ever had a sin or an issue in your life where when you start praying about it, you're praying that the Lord fixes all the people that are causing you to have the problem? Well, I've recently come to the realization and the sobering fact of, you know what, Chad? We're going to work on you first. I'll take care of everybody else, but you know what? You need to look in the mirror. We'll fast forward a bit here. Three weeks ago, I'm sitting in Celebrate Recovery up here and Thursday evening, and we've got a transition going for the summer. Just Terry and Sue are taking a break. And uh, so I was there just to, to help everybody out, to encourage them. And, you know, that's what pastor's supposed to do, right? So... And uh, sitting in sharing time, and you don't have to share when you're in sharing time. You can just listen. And, you know, the Lord spoke very clearly to me in a moment and said, you know what, Chad, you need to share about your struggle with anger and some of the specifics and to humble yourself before these guys here and ask for just their prayer and support. 
You guys know what pride feels like when it wells up in you full force in the moment? Well, I felt that. <laughs> there ain't no way. I don't need to share that. There ain't no way. No, you know what? Lord, I will. Because I know you work with the humble, and I know it's pride right now in full force in my life. And I do want help in this area. You know, last week at Celebrate Recovery, I will tell you honestly, after what I shared with the guys, I got home and told Stace, I said, you know what, I just, I feel like the Lord is helping me. Ah, the Lord is helping me make headway with some of these issues of anger and criticism I've had in my life. I feel like there's some really some hope. Folks, you know, sin is not okay. Sin is not okay. And church, church always has to be a place, and we have to remember this, that where it's okay for you not to be okay. Dads, it's okay for you this morning not to be okay. Because this dad is not always Okay. You're not alone. We're not alone. We need each other. We need each other. Church within these walls and outside these walls, as we gather and live life together, we have got to allow the pride of the mass to come down and be willing to share with each other, to grow together, to humble ourselves before the Lord. And I don't know where... Any of you are at today, but I know this. I know right now, Jesus is thumping some of you, some gently, some maybe you are really getting thumped, and just things in your life, sin in your life, that you, it's time to deal with. He's going, you know, it's time, to, it's time to deal with, you fill in the blank. He's doing a great job of telling you what it is. And for some of you, God's tapping you that you need to come to celebrate recovery this week. We meet on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock up in the gym. We would love to see you there. Some of you need that. And some of you have known you've needed it for a while, and your pride is keeping you from attending. I just want to encourage you. I want to lovingly encourage you. We would love to have you there. It is a safe place to not be okay. And the good news is, is that, you know what, none of us here are alone in the struggle. We're all at different phases and pieces, but we're not alone in this. And there's strength and victory when we humble ourselves with each other and with friendships. That's when God can really start to work in our lives and do amazing things. Noah pursued to be righteous Because he knew that walking with God is where life was. Lastly, Noah was obedient. Hebrews 11.7 says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. And in the context of the text we're reading this morning, Genesis 7.5 says that Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. To do. You know, it's been said that life, a life of obedience, is not a dash, it's a marathon. It's lived day by day, year by year, moment by moment. You know, and ideally in a relationship, a healthy one, obedience is packaged with honor. You know, you can force somebody. To be obedient in certain circumstances. But when obedience is packaged with honor, that's what we're always desiring. That's what God desires. And think about where Noah was for a moment. Just think about where he is in this. You know, we know the end of the story. Noah's not there yet. And Noah gets the headline of, you know what, Noah, I want, to, I want you to spend the next few decades of your life building a gigantic boat 
And when people ask you what you're doing, I want you to preach a message of repentance to them and tell them that they need to get on that boat and get right with the Lord. What? <laughs> you look in Hebrews, Noah obeyed doing things that were, they were unseen, they were unknown yet. A giant boat? You're going to do what? You're going to flood the entire world? What? It's unimaginable. I mean, this is big. This is, this is big, Lord, what you're asking me. And yet, when you look at Scripture, there's no indication that Noah gave any sort of rebuttal back against the Lord and challenging him. How was Noah able to do that? And I think it's because of this. Because of the relationship Noah had with God. He had spent years walking and listening with the Lord. And he knew God's voice. He knew it well, so when he heard it, he knew exactly who was talking to him. And he knew that he could trust that voice. Do we spend enough time? Do you spend enough time? Do I spend enough time with Jesus that I know his voice? I can recognize his voice? You know, that comes through that daily walk, that daily time in prayer we have with Him, the daily time in devotion with Him, and Him speaking to us through His words. It takes time. It takes time with fellow Christians talking about Him, learning to hear His voice. We've got to know His voice well so that when we hear it, we understand it and we'll be willing to do what he expects us to do. This is why Noah was able to step out in confidence. He knew the voice he was hearing was the Lord's and he knew he could trust that voice. And I think Noah would need that for all the decades ahead. Same thing, we read this story and it's like, I think, man, you fill in life through that. He was going to spend decades building this massive ark. Think of being married to Noah now. And you, is my husband crazy? Do you know what you would listen to and take going out in public? Going to the market? The branding you have because of the obedience of what your husband is doing? Think of being his kids. Think of how your social life just tanked. Who's going to go out and deal with that every day? Oh, look who's here. We know who your dad is. Being the brunt of every joke. And yet, Noah trusted God and obeyed him. And God rewarded Noah for his obedience. That's the sweet part as you go through the story of Noah and the facts of his life. That because of his obedience, God rewarded him. Because of Noah's choices... In his obedience to God, Noah's life, the life of his wife, the life of his sons, his daughter-in-laws, they were saved because of the godly choices and decisions that Noah had made for himself and his family. Life comes through walking with God. You know, Noah had a life full of choices because... He had plenty of opportunity, just as any man, to wake up every day and go, you know what, not today, Lord. I'm just having an off day. We don't see that. I'm sure he had his human moments of internal challenges, but he stayed faithful. And you and I have those same choices every day. Dad, you and I have those same choices. Everyone in this room has those same choices every day when we get up. Choices that are going to affect our life. They're going to affect the lives of those we're touching. They're going to affect the life of our family. And we need to make sure that we're making choices that will lead us to walk with God. Because walking with God is where real life comes from. I've got a picture of a rear view mirror. In a windshield. 
You know, and the rearview mirror is exactly what it is. It shows what's behind you, where you've been, but it's what's out in front of you that's coming yet. And some of you, when you look in the rearview mirror, it's like, ah, oh, you see great successes, joyous moments, victory moments. Yes, and you can't, but you can't live in those moments. They were there, yep, it's a memory. Glance in the mirror, that was great. And for some of you, you look in the mirror and you see regrets. You're seeing failures, things that try to haunt you, to chase you. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but I know when you think of what's in that mirror, and usually it can be something negative, and you can be saying, Pastor Chad, you don't know the half of it. No, I don't. Some of those things were life-altering. But I do know this. I know this, as the words in the song say, I know the Savior who gives beauty to ashes, and He can turn graves into gardens. And the good news is, is that we have today. We have today. It doesn't... The mirror is past, it's gone. What we have is the windshield. We have out in front of us. We have today and forward with the Lord. And the choices I'm making today, and the choices you're making today, God can use to lead you on a road of grace and excitement that you can't even imagine. Because He's given you today. What is one choice that you can make today to help you move forward in walking with God? I have to ask myself that. Believe me, when you're putting together stuff like this, it hammers you all week long. But what is, what is one choice? What is something that you can do today, that I can do today? One thing. It may be a small thing. It may be a big thing today. But one thing to move you closer in your walk with God. For some of you it may be the first step in faith. It may be your first response to acknowledging what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. And in order for you to find God's favor and grace and to get right with Him, it starts there in receiving and accepting Jesus' payment for your sins. And when you do that, God says, ah, you just found grace in my eyes. For some of you, it's your relationship. Your relationship with the Lord isn't where it's supposed to be. Maybe it's stagnant a little bit. Maybe there's challenging thin, things of sin in your life that the Lord's dealing with you today. You have today. You have today. I have today. You have today to make choices to respond to the Lord in that. It could be the Lord's calling you to an act of obedience where he's, he's asking you to step out in faith to do something big and you're just scared to death to enter into Him with that. And He's just looking for you to honor Him and say, do you trust me? Do you trust me to reward you through that obedience? What choices are we making today? You know, life comes from walking with Jesus. As we close today, dads, I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you as we close today. And those of you online too, we're going to be praying over you as well. So what I'm going to ask here in just a moment is this. Is Dad, I'm gonna, dads, I'm going to first ask you to stand a moment. So you can go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to ask the rest of you to stand with, with the dads. And maybe, you're, maybe your dad isn't present here today, whatever the case may be, but we're going to pray over our dads. I'm going to pray, so you introverts don't be getting freaked out right now. I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy, okay? But I would like you to, families, go ahead and stand with your dads, friends. If you see dads who are alone, 
and you don't have a dad today, maybe gather towards somebody as well too. But I don't know what kind of day you're having. I don't know what kind of week you've had. I don't know what kind of year you're having. I know for some of us, we've got our rough moments. But this is a day to encourage us as fathers because this is what I do know no matter where you're at as a dad today. God has given you the privilege and the task to be the best father to your family that you can be. That's what he's entrusted you to do. And so wherever you're at today, Dad, this prayer is for you. May you receive the Lord's blessing as we pray together. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I stand with my brothers, fellow dads today, and we recognize that the family unit was your idea and your design, and you've given us dads a special role in the family. And I ask you today, Lord, to forgive us where we've fallen short, Father, I pray that today is a new day in our homes. That today forgiveness is first offered by us. That today our hearts are soft and broken before you. And that today we love our family with the tenderness and the purity that they deserve. Lord, I pray that today we encourage our family with the future you have for them. Father, I pray that today our homes would be a place of safety and rest. And Father, I pray that today the needs of our family will come first before ours. And I pray that today our children would see the strength of a man when he is humble before the Lord. Lord, I pray that today we lead our families in the fear of the Lord and seek to walk with Father, you've given us today. Tomorrow is coming. Yesterday has gone. May today be a new day in our family. I pray your blessing over these dads in Jesus' loving name.